Good, good morning, everybody. How are you? It's good to see you. Uh, certainly good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we've got a few moving parts this morning, and so it's all good. I'm just so glad that we have this chance to, to be together. Josiah, can I have my, is my Bible there? Nope, this one right. I'll just use yours. How about that? This is what we'll do. I told you we were going to have a special guest this morning, and so we do. Uh, Dr. Wes Fowler is here, and uh, I, I don't have to point him out. He's the tallest guy in the house, which probably he has that a lot, uh, but he'll be able to come up and, uh, and share the word with us here in just a little bit. Actually, I was sharing with him a little bit ago. Um, we got to hear him uh, at the annual meeting last year. That was kind of his first address uh, to the congregation and so uh, upon hearing that, it was uh, just recognition of how uh, he just wanted to preach, you know, a gospel-centered uh, uh, message and how it was uh, well-received and, of course, powerful. And when we got done, uh, knowing that we had our associational annual meeting that was in the works and I was chairperson for that program committee, uh, Lori immediately said, you need to have him come and speak at the annual meeting. And I thought, well, that's a... That's a pretty good piece of advice we probably ought to see if that could happen and so uh dr fowler honestly if you don't preach well then my wife's reputation is on the line so uh however if you preach really well then my reputation's on the line so i guess i'm in a bit of a pickle today no i'm really joking I, i've looked forward to this um this is his this is still his first year and uh i know from testimony of others uh, he, he would, and much like he said earlier, he'd rather be nowhere else on a Sunday uh, in God's house with, uh, with some of his Missouri Baptist family. And so I'm just excited for him to be here. Don't forget, he is also uh, speaking at our annual associational meeting later today. Starts at two o'clock. It will be at First Baptist Jackson. And that is the 200th anniversary uh, for this one. So it is significant. And so we're so glad to be able to, to join, to worship, to hear the, the reports from our ministries and what what work the Lord is doing through uh, our people here in, in the Cape Baptist Association as well. So come and be a part of that. I also wanted to give you a couple other um, uh, announcements, and that is uh, the Lighthouse Dinner. If you're familiar with the Lighthouse at SEMO campus, uh, that's going to be uh, coming up. And so you have that on your bulletin of what the menu is. Um, and uh, if you need uh, or have a chance to, to be a, a part or a help with that, uh, you get with Miss Patty or Miss Ellen, uh, and they will get you connected with either supplies that they need or, of course, being able to volunteer um, for that effort. And, and don't forget, the vast majority of the college students that come to that meal are international students. And so God is bringing the, the world uh, to, uh, to our house uh, in, uh, in, in Cape Girardeau. And so we have the chance to get to know them uh, and of course to witness to them as well. And then of, uh, just, just to let you know of, of, you know, just make sure the other events that you have uh, would be uh, well for you to, to notate. Don't forget fall festival. It's that time of year, it's coming up. And so there's a sign up outside in the foyer for you to take part in that. Uh, small groups, there've been a sign up last week. They're still there for the, the two groups that we'll have this go round uh, in the next few weeks that we start and uh, we'll head through close to Thanksgiving. Um, hope you'll be a, a part of that as well. I just want to begin by uh, reading the word this morning and then we want to have a special prayer emphasis after that. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 starting in verse 28. It says, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That is for us, as a lot of times we'll think of Christ as our redemption, we'll think of him as our salvation, we'll think of him as our sanctification, but we know that he is our wisdom. But what is true wisdom? Wisdom is not making a good, good choice. It's making a godly choice. It's making the one that honors the Lord. It's not just an experience that you have had already and then know how to react in the middle of whatever you're doing. If it's never happened before, it is obeying him and honoring him and seeking what is best to glorify him in that moment so that we might be a testimony of his grace and his mercy. He is above all things. And of course, it is all to the glory of his name. And this morning, I hope that you can 
share that with us, that you can lift high the name of Jesus because he is the name above all names and we know that he alone is our source of salvation as well. So let's join together this morning. Let's worship. Uh, let's, let's pray as we begin. But as we pray, I'm gonna ask Joe Hoffmeister to do that. Uh, and I also wanted to ask Joe uh, if he would put a, a special emphasis on the disaster relief efforts that are going on uh, in several states right now because of Hurricane Helene. Uh, Dan Dickerson, if you did not know, is already down there on site. I'm sure some of you have seen his posts on our Facebook page. Now, they are feeding thousands uh, a day. And of course, as the efforts uh, continue, then our, our Missouri Disaster Relief will be doing more than just feeding meals. Uh, they will be going out uh, with chainsaw crews, I'm sure, and mud out uh, crews, and it will be doing a full effort. And it will be an ongoing relief effort for quite some time. So be in prayer for that. Also, I'll just say, if you're interested in being a part of that, I know that there are efforts and trainings and getting people down there uh, constantly. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll get you connected uh, to the appropriate people. So Brother Joe, if you would open up this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that in your creative effort, you set aside an entire day make it holy, to set it apart, to call us apart from our activity activities. We celebrate that today as we honor you with our time here together as a corporate body. We honor you and worship you. Now, for you are good and holy God. Lord, we ask that you remember our fellow countrymen uh, throughout the land that is impacted by this storm. We pray for them and already heard a lot of the party and the stories that have come in those areas. Lord, we pray that you'll be with these families, be with these communities, and help them, Lord, pour out your grace and mercy upon them. We especially pray for those that are there to minister, to assist, to rescue those efforts that are on the line, especially those that we are involved with, that we support even from our own congregation, Lord. We lift them up to you. Pray that you'll sustain them and keep them. Strengthen them and encourage them uh, that they could be a light for you, shining in the time of darkness in those areas. Literal darkness, Lord, those that are still without power. We pray that you'll bless them, keep them, give them the grace and the mercy. We thank you for this time to follow, this worship time. May you be pleased with our worship together. May you be with Dr. Fowler as he comes to your way for us. Give us open hearts, Lord, fertile minds to hear your word. Let it grow in us richly. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand willing and able to worship our Lord this morning.
It says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And great is the Lord. He is worthy of our worship, as this next song sings about. He's worthy of our worship, he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of all honor and all glory. And as, as the chorus goes along, he is worthy, he is father, he is creator, he is savior, he is sustainer. He is worthy of our praise, amen.
shown us through your son Jesus Lord we just pray this upcoming moment right now as we hear your word proclaimed open up our hearts to your word and as we hear your word proclaimed we pray father that as you open up our hearts we pray that we will respond as you would have us to respond we love you and you alone are worthy of our worship and praise this morning we thank you we pray all these things in Jesus' name amen you may be seated Well, good morning. That didn't sound very enthusiastic. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, that, that was quite a bit better. Are you, uh, are you happy to be the house of the Lord? Yes. All right. Did I phrase that a little funny? Normally people would say, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord, right? Yes. Yeah, and I, I actually say it a little differently. Are you happy to be the house of the Lord? Because in Christ, you are the church. This is a building, and you come here together corporately, and you worship, but you are the body of Christ. And so when I say, are you happy? Well, let me tell you how this started real quick. When I was a, a, a pastor, I would say for years, I would say, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? And the church would say, amen. Well, then this one Sunday, we'd actually been preaching through, through Hebrews, and in Hebrews chapter 3, it talks about how if you're in Christ, you're actually the house of the Lord. So anyway, I had this college student after the sermon come and say, hey, I know you always say, are we happy to be in the house? But the Bible actually says that we're the house of the Lord. I said, do not correct the preacher. Okay? <laughs> That's number one. But then number two, you're right. And so from that day forward, I started asking the church body, are you happy to be the house of the Lord? Turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 16. We'll be there shortly. Matthew chapter 16. By the way, that works out well because you guys have been in Matthew, haven't you? Yeah, I did not know that when I selected this, this text. This morning, though, I was listening to your preacher who does a fantastic job, by the way. I get to hear preaching all across Missouri, and I want you to know you've got a great preacher right here. You really, really do. Matthew chapter 16 is where we'll be shortly. Uh, you guys were actually in this text. As soon as I, I learned that you were in Matthew, I'm like, I wonder when this text was last preached, and it was back in May. And so uh, being a pastor for a long time, I know that you remember nothing from May, okay? <laughs> I, I know that. I know that. And, and where I pastored in Mayfield, Kentucky would have been exactly the, uh, the same way. So my name is West, by the way, and I do serve as the executive director treasurer of the Missouri Baptist Convention. Raise your hand if you know exactly what that means. One of my bosses in here does, that's right. She, she serves on the board. The best thing about this position is hardly anybody knows what it does, which means I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm doing the right thing. It's awesome. And so I'll, I'll tell you what, what I, I primarily work on. This is, 
primarily the, the role that I play in Missouri Baptist life. Number one, I get to steward the cooperative program dollars. Now that may sound boring at first, okay? But it's really not. As a local pastor, Mayfield, Kentucky, First Baptist Mayfield, I got to steward the resources of, of one local body of believers. In fact, when I got there, the church was giving 4% to the cooperative program. But when I left, we were giving 8.75%. So I got to walk them through this process and show them what the cooperative program does and how, how it supports ministries in your own state, how it supports ministries all across the United States, and how it supports ministries all across the world. Well, in this role that I enjoy now, blessed to have this role, I, I, don't, I don't just see the benefit of one, of one church. In Missouri Baptist Life, you need to hear this, we have 1,718 churches that come together supporting the cooperative program for ministry all around the world. And I think it's a beautiful thing to be able to see that every week, those resources coming in and get to be a part of the stewardship of that. This church supports the cooperative program. So let me say thank you. Thank you for that. It's very meaningful not only to our state and not only to the United States, but it's meaningful to the world. Secondly, a big part of my, my job is I get to, to work alongside and partner with our entities. Anybody know how many entities we have in Missouri Baptist Life? Good. We've, we've, got, we've got six. We've got six entities and I, am, I did not know this when I took this role. I'm actually on the board of every single entity, and every entity meets four or five times a year. So like half my schedule is traveling to, to board meetings, which oftentimes can be boring, but do not tell them that I, I said that. But I'm in these meetings. I, I'm joking when I say it. It's actually a really neat thing. So we have three universities, if you don't know this, in Missouri Baptist life. We have Missouri Baptist University in St. Louis. We have Hannibal LaGrange University up in Hannibal, and we have Southwest Baptist in, in Bolivar. And it's neat to see what they're doing. It's neat to be a part of just the lives of those students as they're being educated from a biblical worldview. We have a foundation that's based out of Jeff City that helps people steward and manage their, their resources, their money, for kingdom purposes. I've actually seen a scenario in my first year where a lady passed away and left money to the foundation, and her money is being used right now to continue ministry for the gospel. So even though she's no longer here on earth, she's actually in, in glory right now, what, what she had is still being used to lead people to Christ. And I think that is really, really neat. We have a children's home in St. Louis. A lot of folks know about the children's home doing tremendous work. And of course, we have Baptist Homes and Healthcare, Senior Adult Ministry. Those are the six entities that I get to kind of partner with and have a relationship with, be on every single board. And, and it's just a blessing. It's great. So that's two things. Cooperative program, our entities. But then third, the part of my job that I go to bed thinking about, even last night, knowing that I was going to be here this morning. And the part of my job that I wake up thinking about is we exist to serve the local church and to serve our pastors. I ask this, this question oftentimes. Can this church exist right here, this local body of believers? Can you exist without the Missouri Baptist Convention? You're right. So you're shaking your head yes. He's like, absolutely we can. And you need to know that. Do you, do you know what you need to exist as the body of Christ? You need the Lord Jesus. You need the Word of God. You, you can stand behind this pulpit and proclaim the Word of God, and you have all that you need right here. Before 1835, a church like this would have existed without the convention. The convention was formed in 1835. Now, let me ask you another question. Can the convention, the Missouri Baptist Convention, can we exist without you? We cannot. I point this out not to just say who existed first or who does what. I point out to say, to me, it's very clear who serves who in this relationship. So the Missouri Baptist Convention, we exist to serve our, our, local, our local churches, our local pastors. And it is, it's a blessing. It's actually an honor to spend time and just build relationships with churches and pastors. We have another Missouri Baptist staff, Buddy Funk, right here, who leads our, he's a director for Arbor Sound Network. Is it awesome to spend time with churches all the time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And get to help churches through difficulties. Is that great? I mean, the only answer is yes right now when I'm putting you on the spot, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We have a DO women here, John Vernon. Where's John? Right, right, right there. Do you love spending time with our local pastors, our local ministry leaders, and helping them do what they do? Absolutely. It is, it is such an honor 
to get to serve in these roles, walking right alongside our local churches and helping them do what they do. Now, the most important part today, it really has nothing to do with the message other than I kind of want you to know what my, what my job was, at least what I think it is. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to work on. Matthew, Matthew 16, uh, verses 13 through 20 here in, in just, just a moment. Is, is life full of questions, yes or no? I just ask you one. You'll have 20 more questions by the end of today. The, the question that I like to put out there quite a bit that my, my wife always asks me, we've been married now for, for 20 years. I tell people it's been the best 20 years of her life is what I, I usually put out there. But the question that she'll always ask me, it'll be a Friday night, we get in the car because we're gonna have like a date night. I've got a 15 year old who can watch the younger two kids. We've got a 15 year old, 11 year old, nine year old. So the 15 year old, he, he can watch the kids now a little bit and then we'll go out on a date. And what's the first thing that she asks me when we get in the car? Where do you wanna go eat? I try to keep my faith in this moment. You know, I'm like, I don't care. I, I do not care. Well, you want to go here? You want to go there? One, one night she said, you want to go to Longhorn? I'm like, yep, let's go to Longhorn. Let's, let's do it. Don't care. Went to Longhorn. Then a couple weeks later, we go back out again. She's like, where do you want to go? Well, I know the answer now. I'm like, how about we go to Longhorn? She's like, I was really thinking Olive Garden. So in this question, by the way, where do you want to go eat? I learned where she does not want to go eat, okay? I learned over the years, gentlemen, I learned over the years that she does not like Wendy's, okay? She does, she's not a fan of Wendy's at, at all, hates, hates Wendy's. If you work there, I'm sorry, she just doesn't like it. She doesn't like it. So now when we get in the car and she says, where do you want to go eat? I say, real quick, I'm really craving Wendy's. <laughs> really, I've had it on my mind for, for days. So do you know what she has stopped asking me in the last few years? She no longer asks me where I want to go eat. Because I say Wendy's every single time. Gentlemen, take notes on that. It works. It works on that. Again, the whole Wendy's conversation really doesn't have a lot to do with the sermon today, but I just wanted you to know that, that story. Is life full of questions, yes or no? I can list a few here. What clothes are you going to wear? What shoes are you going to wear? What car are you going to drive? What house are you going to live in? What city are you going to live in? What school are you going to go to? Who are you going to marry? How many children are you going to have? Where will you work? And the list just goes on and on. And there's question after question after question in life. Would you agree with that? I got all day. Okay, good. Are some questions more important than others? They really, really are. So what we're going to encounter in this text today, maybe you've already read through it, is there's, there's, some, there's some questions in here. So look with me. Chapter 16, starting in verse 13. And I want you to really notice the questions that come up in this text. There's, there's really two main ones that I want us to focus on. Starting in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? There's a question. And they said, well, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah and, and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? There's another question. And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Interesting phrase, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you, you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, there are several things that we could focus on in this text. I'm going to kind of limit it to just these questions. Number one, I'm going to say this. If you happen to be taking notes, this was what I would put down first. In this text, there's an interesting question. That's number one. There, there is an interesting question. Look back up at verses 13 and 14. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? That's interesting. 
It was obviously a topic of conversation in the first century. People had heard about Jesus. People had been in a village maybe where he did some healings. People had heard stories about Jesus. So he's asking, who do people say that I, that I am? One time I got, to, uh, I got to interview a famous athlete. Probably never heard of him. His name is Tim Tebow. And I was... It was actually a, a weird situation. They had somebody else lined up to, to, to interview him, and then the Tebow organization found out that the person that was going to interview him was going to actually try to make money off of it, et cetera. So I had the, 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 the guy that organized the whole event, who happened to be a church, a church member of mine, he called and he said, listen, man, we're, we're four days away from this interview. There's going to be thousands of people there, and, and they just called and told me that I couldn't use the guy that, uh, that I was going to use. And what they, what they said is they, they don't want a professional. And I thought about you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's what I said. And so I said, well, sure, man, I would love to interview Tim Tebow. How cool, how cool would that be? And so I got to go like backstage and for like 45 minutes hang out with just he and his brother Robbie and talk to him about life and about what all he was going through. And any, anyway, that, that was neat. And then I got to, what a, a neat moment was I said, I said, hey, Tim, here's how I'm going to end it. Here's how I'm going to end this whole conversation. It's like a 45-minute conversation. But I said, this is my last question I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say, hypothetically, if you could share one message with 5,000 people, what would that be? And he looked at me and he goes, I don't mind the question, but why? that's a weird hypothetical question. Why, are you, why would you do that? I'm like, well, because it's, it's funny. He's like, well, why is it funny? He's like, I said, because well, there's 5,000 people out there. It's not, it's not hypothetical. Like, it's, a real, it's the real thing. You're going to be speaking to 5,000 people. And he goes, there's 5,000 people here? He had no idea because it was in a high school gym. But in West Kentucky, a high school gym seats over 5,000 people. You know, that's kind of a big deal in, in Kentucky life. If you, if you know that, go Wildcats, you know. But that, anyway, that was after the event, after I got to spend time with, with him, people would come up to me and they would say, tell me about, tell me about Tim Tebow. Tell me about Tim. Hey, how was he? Was he as nice as people say? What did he say to you? What did you guys talk about? I even had this young lady come up to me and she said, are you the one that interviewed Tim Tebow? And I said, yes. She goes, did you shake his hand? I'm like, well, yeah, of course I, of course I did. I shook his hand. He hugged me. It was interesting. I'm not a hugger. Don't, don't hug me. But, but anyway, Tim Tebow hugged me. Anyway, she goes, which hand did he shake? I'm like, well, this one. And she grabbed my hand. She wanted to touch the hand that had touched Tim Tebow. And I said, you are weird. <laughs> like, don't do that. It's awkward. Well, that's with an athlete. When you hear rumors that somebody's healing people, you hear stories that this guy's doing miracles from town to town that the, the blind can now see. A leper has been healed. People are saying stuff about this man. People are talking about this, this man. So Jesus says, the first question is interesting. Who do people say the son of man is? People were talking about him. There's no doubt. And people have believed different things about Jesus. Even here in the text, you can kind of see it. It kind of comes to the surface in verse 14, for example. You know, is he, is he John the Baptist? In other words, is, is he a spokesman for God? Some even thought he was a resurrected John the Baptist. Matthew 14, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. People were hearing about the fame of Jesus. I'm not making this up. This fame was going around. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. People are saying, who is this? And are, is he John the Baptist? It's right there in the text. Is, one of the, is this Elijah? Malachi chapter 4 says this, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. People are saying, is the day of the Lord upon us? Is this Elijah? Is, is that who this Jesus is? Is he a, a preacher of judgment and repentance? In other words, Jeremiah or one of the prophets? Who is he? I want us to kind of consider that. Was he merely a good teacher? Was he merely a prophet? Was he merely a man of wisdom? Or was he more? I had a, a teacher... Uh, so my, my undergraduate degree, when I went to college, I got a degree in political science. And my joke has been that's actually worked out pretty good, you know, in the church. A lot of politics in the church. I try to stay away from all that. But 
I got a degree in political science, but when I, when I got my, my degree, I did not notice at the time that I was going to be in ministry, but they offered, I was a believer, and they offered some, some classes at a secular university, so not, not Christian, a secular university, they offered classes in Bible, New Testament, and I'm like, I'm going to take some of those. This will be like Sunday school on steroids. This will be great. And so I, I signed up for these classes, and I went in there, and this, this, the teacher was a lady, and she was so intelligent. She was so smart, and she just... Of course, she had a PhD like in New Testament and she, she could she just walk through these passages but there was something about what she was saying that, that she was smart but I wasn't sure that she even believed what she was saying. So there was this one day in class in front of about 40 people. 40 people in this class. I raised my hand. Again, I'm a 20-something year old. Raised my hand. And I said, yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you're saying. I just want to know, based on what you're saying, I'm curious, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Kind of an awkward pause. And, and she said, well, there are groups of people in the first century that believe this about Jesus. And then there are groups of people that we see forming in the second and third century that believe this about Jesus. And, and I mean, she talked for like 10 minutes, 12 minutes. I raised my hand. I said, I, I love that answer. That's great. It's just not what I asked. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do you believe, as our teacher of New Testament, do you believe that he's the Christ. And right there, I mean, I just kept backing her into it. And I wasn't even trying to be mean. I just kind of want to know if the person teaching me about the Bible, I want to know what they believe about Jesus. I think that's kind of important. And in front of the class, she said, she said, well, if you're going to make me answer that question, I will. She said, I, I do not believe that he's the Christ. I want, you to, I want you just to kind of think about it. This is an interesting question because people can think all kinds of things about Jesus. They can know all about Jesus. She wrote articles about Jesus. She went to relig like religious conferences and symposiums and all these things where like really well-educated, smart people go and she would speak about the Bible and about Jesus. But she did not believe that he was the cross. Okay? To kind of... You have to have a category in your mind that you can know all kinds of stuff about him without really knowing who he is. Well, secondly, in this, in this text, I think the question gets, so you got an interesting question. Then number two, you get this personal question. Verses 15 and 16. He said to them, but who do you say I am? It's good to know what everybody else says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, I love his answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He gets very personal. In fact, the you in this text is emphatic. It means that it is emphasized. Who do you say Jesus is? I want to pause in the sermon and ask it. What if this is the most important question in the history of existence? It's not just the most important question like in your life. What if it's the most important question in all of existence? One time I was talking about eternity in a sermon and I had one of my youth at First Baptist Mayfield. The sanctuary is this really long structure. So I got a piece of yarn, like a, a string, and then I had him get the string and go all the way to the other end. And I said, keep going out the door. Keep going out into the road. Don't get hit by a car. And this, the youth just listens to you blindly and just goes out the door, not even really thinking about the cars. And then I, I got a clothespin. And I put a clothespin on the line right here. Can everybody picture this? Say yes. Okay. And then I said, from the clothespin to this hand represents like the beginning of time up until you. The, the width, the width of the clothespin. Now, they're actually seeing this in real life. I could have done it this morning. I just didn't bring a string or a clothespin. But the width of the clothespin actually represents your whole lifespan, 80, 90, 100 years. The rest of it represents eternity. And I stopped and I said, I want you to know that this, this example that I'm showing you right now is a terrible example because we all know at the other end of this string one of our youth is holding it and hopefully not getting hit by a car. Eternity doesn't end. There's no end to it. 
The string just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. You, you, there is all this time from creation until you. Your lifespan is actually not even the width of this clip, this clothespin. And eternity is much longer than my example makes it sound. So what if there's really one question that determines all of eternity? I would say this, it's not, it's not hypothetical, this is real. There are questions in life that are important. You know, where should I go to school? What should I do for a living? Who should I marry? Where should I live? What should I drive? But those are all second, like by a mile. In fact, they're second by miles and miles and miles to the main question of who is Jesus. I want you to contemplate this morning before we go. What if there is really just one question that determines not the next hundred years or the next thousand years or even the next 10,000 years, but all of eternity? It's not a what if scenario it's reality Peter answered you are the Christ let me pause here we say Jesus Christ pretty quickly pretty easily uh, I listened to the sermon from, from May and your preacher did a great job he, he said you know Christ is not his last name like, it's not we, we, we kind of put those together real quickly it, it is his, his, his title but I want you to know he, like Jesus is the Christ, Jesus Christ. I want you to know that when, when Peter said this, this was not easy. There's so much packed into this word Christ that you really can't even fathom it today in here. I'm going I'm to try to, to let you know, but it, I'll give you a, a good example with, with just some words here. What if I said 9-11? How many of you remember exactly where you were on 9-11 when the terrorists hit the towers? How many of you remember? So when I say 9-11, it's, ju- it's really just... A number, a dash, and 11. It sounds so, so small, but is there like a ton? You can visualize things right this second that happened on 9 11. You remember where you were on 9 11? You remember the news coverage? You remember the death toll? You remember how terrible this was? There's so much packed into just 9 slash 11, right? If I say the word Holocaust, it's one word, but how much is packed in to that word Holocaust? Like there's just so much there. There's class after class after class. There's actually degrees on on studying Jewish history and the Holocaust. My point is to say that in this one word, Christ, there's so much in that one word. So much in that. When when Peter said this, this is what he's really, you are the the Christ. What he is saying is is this. I'm going to read this quickly. So I'm going to expect you to know all 17 of these here. When he said, you are the Christ, he's really saying this, that that you're the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. And you're the substitute that we read about in Genesis 22. And you're the lamb in Exodus 12. And you're the day of atonement in Leviticus. That you're the rock that provided water for Moses. You're the Messiah of Psalm 110. You are Emmanuel in Isaiah 7. You're that child in Isaiah 9. You're the righteous branch in Isaiah 11. You're the suffering savior in Isaiah 53. You're the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. You're the one who gives life to dry bones in Ezekiel 37. You're the fourth man in the fiery furnace in Daniel 3. You're the one that God promised. You're the one who can save us. You are the Messiah. That is what's packed into that word. Christ. So when Peter said that, it was not small. His parents told him that one day the Christ would come. His grandparents had told him that one day the Christ would come. His great-grandparents had told him that one day God would send the Christ. It was massive to say that you are the Christ. And Jesus said, you're right. You're right. So let me close with this third point. You got an interesting question. You got a very personal question. And to me, Peter gave an eternal answer. An eternal answer. Verse 18. And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates, listen to this part. This is where I'm going to end on this, this neat little phrase here. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You ever just stop sometime in a quiet time and say, what does that mean? Well, I've read that a thousand times. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Like, are there literal gates in hell that are going to go to war against the church? I mean, I, that, that would look funny. 
gates swinging everywhere. I don't know what this, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What, what does this mean? Well, I found a commentator who is a, he's a Jewish historian, and, and he said this, it's more than likely in the first century, of course, when all this was being talked about and when Jesus was actually saying these words, that this phrase, the gates of hell, was likely a Jewish idiom. Not idiot, right? But idiom. What's an idiom? It's raining cats and dogs. How many have ever, have ever said that before? Well, to a, to a stranger that doesn't live here, coming from a foreign land, maybe, if you say, man, it's raining cats and dogs today, that's going to be a little strange, right? Stop beating around the bush. Somebody could literally picture you beating around the bush and not know what in the world you're talking. Hey, the ball's in your court. Somebody doesn't know what we're talking about and you say the ball's in your court. I mean, that's going to sound a little strange. The one I like in western Kentucky all the time that I heard growing up, I didn't know what it meant until I was probably a teenager. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Anybody ever heard that one before? You know that one? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. These are like little sayings that we know the meaning of. We know exactly. So the power, what, 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 what is this? That the gates of hell, well, one Jewish commentator said this, it, it more than likely meant this to the people that heard that. The power of death. The gates of hell was likely understood to mean the power of death. In other words, what was likely being communicated was that the power of death will not defeat the church. The power of death will not defeat those who place their faith in Christ. How powerful is death? How many of you know someone who has died? Well, we all do. How many have been to a funeral, maybe even recently? How many have lost a father, a mother, spouse, or even a child to death? It feels pretty powerful. How many of you, maybe even in this room, you've been diagnosed and told that death might be a real possibility? It feels pretty powerful in that moment. How many of you have lost a loved one through a sudden tragedy? And death feels really, really powerful. How many of you worry about someone you love dying? How many of you look forward to death? How many of you are fearful of death? Is death powerful? Yes or no? It really is. Death is powerful. But in Christ, hear me as I am almost done. In Christ, death does not win. It is the beauty of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, paying our price, the penalty that we deserve. We sin, therefore we die. Jesus died in our place, taking our sin and taking our punishment. But the beauty of Easter is that death could not hold him. He defeated death in the resurrection, which means, by the way, he defeated sin. And the Bible tells us that when we place our faith and our trust in him, not just as a prophet and not just as a wise man, but as the Christ, that your sin is forgiven and you too will live forever in heaven. So here's how I want to close out. This morning, I would like to ask you life's most important question. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ? the Son of the living God. I sincerely pray that you say yes. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you. Remind us in these moments that it's not just knowing about Jesus that matters. It's knowing who he truly, truly is. The Christ the one who can rescue us, the one who can save us. I mean, goodness, everything else in the world may be falling apart at times, or at least it may feel that way. It may seem that way. But the one security that we have is that this world is not our home, is that in Christ our sin is forgiven and we have the promise of eternal life in heaven with our Savior. 
God, help us to answer this question correctly. Who do you say I am? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Fowler for the word. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, it's been a joy. And uh, certainly uh, after service, if you want to meet him, I know he's not afraid of you. And so go and give a, a hand of Christian fellowship and, and, and do so. Uh, express appreciation for his coming and spending his time uh, with us this morning. Uh, I do want to remind you again, uh, the annual meeting for the Association First Baptist Jackson, two o'clock it will go through six o'clock this afternoon or this evening uh, and of course it will end with uh, a dinner uh, no evening services to here tonight as a result of that and so uh, we'll pick back up uh, this next week anything from you matt obviously yeah, no choir practice tonight as well so uh, just looking forward to uh, meeting again this week and so let's go let's be a, a testimony of the christ that we might be a witness uh, to who he truly truly is. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you uh, for the gift of uh, this morning and the place that we are in, uh, a place of safety, uh, a place of comfort. But Lord, I, I just ask you this week that if there are moments uh, where uh, we might get nudged, where the comfort level decreases, uh, where the, uh, the times of uh, us being able uh, to speak, to give an answer for our hope, uh, which is in Jesus, Lord, that we would be willing and able to give that answer, that we would be a verbal witness, uh, not just with a kind deed, certainly I, I hope that we're all able to do those things, but with a, a verbal witness of Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God, that be a testimony of salvation in Him alone, uh, that we would have the boldness and the, and the, uh, the, the compassion to do so. Uh, Lord, in all things, I, I pray that that would start in our own home. Uh, with the ones that we live with, that we would be in a, a display of the gospel there and that it would go uh, through our hearts and our hands and every other place uh, that we, uh, we travel. Lord, I thank you again for Dr. Fowler and his faithful testimony. Uh, we pray that you'd keep him safe uh, to carry him back home to his family and, of course, as he continues to serve, that you serve you through uh, his unique role. And uh, we're just thankful for uh, our partnership with our Missouri Baptist Convention and what it means uh, to join together so that your gospel may go forth, not just in this state, not just in this nation, but around the world. It is certainly for your glory. It's for our good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.